So thank you all for joining. Um, my name is Jonathan Krieger. I'm the Applications Manager at BSI. And what I really wanted to show with this webinar is really a live demonstration of the software, um, as well as um, some, some data of what the, the new version of Peak Studio Pro can do. So I hope you can all hear me and see my screen. If you can't, uh, please uh, let me know. And so as an outline to this talk, I want to provide uh, an overview of what types of analysis can be performed in, in Peaks X Pro, um, show some of the new features, um, as well as some tips and common um, FAQs that the support team often receives that may be helpful for you um, going forward. And to give you a demonstration of, of various data that can be um, done and, and where you'll find certain features within um, the studio. And so, as I mentioned on the webinar last week, if you attended, um, we're a large part of the differences of, of previous versions of peaks and, and new versions of peaks are what we've done is we've essentially um, harmonized both our deployments of Peak Studio and Peaks Online. And so we're now using um, our new algorithm it can be deployed in both the studio format as well as the online format, and you'll get very, very similar results. And so um, next week we'll be showcasing um, the online version um, of, the, of the software. Um, but as I said, the algorithm behind it is now the same and results should be are very, very similar between them. And in both cases, like with all peaks is now, or any other search engines, there's a whole bunch of different approaches for, for protein identification. And this can be either doing a, a spectral library search for peptides, um, where we basically, um, take your MSMS MS spectra and search against a, a library of, of previously generated um, and identified spectra, or we can do a sequence database search um, where we search against a database. And, and this was really helpful for, and obviously the, the, the main um, current search algorithm for, for data dependent acquisition um, data, and this is where we look for sequences from really coding regions of protein. Um, and where Peaks really excels in is also in the de novo sequencing. And so our database search is de novo assisted, but what that also means is we have all the de novo sequences um, that don't match anything in a protein database that can be used um, to identify peptides. Um, that are either not in the database or not from a coding region or have variants or splicing or um, various unexpected post-translational modifications. And so Peak Studio is really designed to be this complete solution for your proteomic analysis. And this really includes things like um, de novo sequencing and your traditional database search for both data dependent acquisition data as well as data independent acquisition data. Our library searches can be used with DIA data um, and, and DDA data library searches in development and hopefully will be out in, in the near future. Um, and then of course, um, important to, to sort of any biological or any other chemical experiment is really quantification. And so um, both DDA and DIA allow for label-free quantification um, as well as labeled quantification, although um, with DIA, that's not really a, a popular choice, um, but certainly for DDA um, data, ITRAC, TMT, SILOC, all of those um, have been drastically improved in this version of Peak Studio, um, as well as the label-free quantification. And I hope to show some of that to you in the demonstration. Um, and then the other thing we've, we've put in is a lot of work on the ion mobility integration. Um, and I touched on this in the, the webinar last week as well, but we've really put a lot of effort into um, 
using the the fourth dimension, whether that be um, a Tim from Timstock data or from Thames or, or Waters um, IM ability data in terms of a feature detection. And I'll touch on that on the next slide as well. And so, as I mentioned, and most of this audience probably knows, Peaks is feature-based. And what does that mean? Well, it means that when we input the data into Studio or into Peaks Online, what we're really looking for, the software is looking for, is this isotopic pattern of peptides. And so, we're really looking at the distribution of the carbon um, across M over Z at particular retention time to identify where peptides and where um, features are coming off in the run. And one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing in this version of Studio is to improve this feature detection. And so that means really um, doing a better job of looking for these overlapping features that may, um, may be coming off in your data. Um, especially for more complex data sets. And that being said, integrating this feature detection into a fourth dimension when IM mobility data is being presented. And so what you can see here on the right side is the um, distribution or the, or the feature detection at the top of the IM mobility dimension over the M over the, and that same feature in the retention time dimension um, as well as just the, the precursor intensity, overall intensity of the, of the monoisotopic peak. And so what does this allow us to do? Well, it allows us to dig a bit deeper into the sample because, because of this improved feature detection, especially with overlapping features, what we're able to do is, is know, or the software is able to know that there are multiple features coming off. And so in particular cases where we have overlapping features regardless of, of intensity, um, these overlapping features are often not gonna be separated out or filtered out by the quadruple. And so they're gonna both end up in the same MS2 spectra. And so when we know that these features can be detected, when we go to that particular MS2 spectra, we're able to identify both the higher intensity ion series um, as shown here, which is, corresponds to the the red feature or the more abundant feature, um, as well as the lower um, intensity ion series um, in the same MS2 scan. And so these you know, features allow us to both do more accurate label-free quantification um, on these peptides as we're able to separate out these, these peaks, but also um, obviously lead to more identifications if we can um, sequence both of these um, spectra. And so what's new in the new version of Studio? Well, as I mentioned, we've really put a lot of effort into harmonizing the, the two deployments. And so regardless of which one you use, um, the functionality should be the same in both. Um, and this includes both uh, de novo sequencing, database searches, library searches, um, PTM and Spider, um, as well as, as label-free quantification and labeled quantification techniques. And so what you would expect to see is consistent results across those platforms. Specifically to XPro, we've put in um, full support for IM mobility. Um, and so this includes Timstoff, Thames, and HDNSE data. And we will have webinars later discussing these um, in more depth, but I will show you some Timstoff and, and FAMES data today. We've really improved the label-free quantification and the match between run algorithm um, for identification-based quantification. Um, we've enhanced the spectral library search algorithm um, for DIA data and includes FAMES DIA swath and, and DIA passive data. Um, and associated with that is we built the Spectral Library Viewer and Editor, um, which allow you to view peaks generated as well as third-party generated um, libraries um, and, and use those libraries for your searches. And then, as I mentioned before, because of the, of the improved feature detection, we really have improved the SILAC and label-free 
um, quantification, including these missing value imputations or match between runs, if you will. And so with that, I'm going to share um, some data that I have. Uh, let me just pull that over here and share the screen with you. And so I'm actually going to try and share the entire desktop with you. So you should be able to see my desktop with the PowerPoint as well as uh, peaks. And if you can't, please do let me know. And so one of the first demonstrations I wanted to show is, is Tim's tough data that was generated uh, from Jurgen Cox's lab and published. Um, and so this data is essentially a, a standardized ground truth data set, if you will. And what this data is, is essentially um, three biological replicates of two samples. And these samples contain um, different amounts of human yeast and E. coli protein spiked in. Um, and so that in order between them, we should observe a, a, an expected ratio. And so we really use this data set as a good benchmarking tool um, to show both DIA and DDA. And so this data set was run in, in DDA mode um, and it's from a Tim's toss. And so what I hope to, to use this data set at first is to show you some of the features of XPro and then um, we'll show you how you can build a library out of that and use it to search the same data set or a different data set um, in Studio. And so um, most of this audience knows, but just in case when you start Studio, you will be given this um, start page um, that contains news as well as, as um, recent projects, if you have any that are open right here. And, and we have this various tools at the top that to try and simplify things. And so obviously these projects wouldn't be here and it, when you open uh, Peaks for the first time or, or from a fresh um, install. And then the other thing I did want to point out to you is many people have new versions on top of old versions on their computer. Um, so to ensure that you're using the latest version, either um, we recommend that you, you actually just launch that directly from the folder. Um, and so in your install folder at the bottom, you'll see a peakstudio.exe. And if you launch from there, you'll be sure to be using the right version. Um, and you can of course create shortcuts from this version um, to pin to your start menu if you use this frequently. The other thing that I will mention um, as it comes up in the common FAQs is the performance configuration. Um, also in the same Peak Studio folder, you have this performance configuration. And if you double click on it, ideally when Peaks is closed, you have the option um, of choosing to automatically configure Peaks performance or manually configure Peaks performance. And we'll discuss this or I'll show you um, a table of the best practices to use here, but I did want to show you where that was in the in the folder. And so before we even start anything, I wanted to show some configuration properties that um, and, and where they were to help you um, get started. And this these will really be tailored to the type of data that you analyze most often. Um, but if you click on the configuration button, which is the, um, the wrench and, and screwdriver button here, you'll bring up this dialog box that has a number of options for you. One of them are the built-in enzymes. And so these are, these are enzymes that are built in. However, if there's an enzyme that you use commonly, for instance, um, elastase, um, what you can do is just create a new enzyme and you simply just click on the new button, you type in the name um, and the cleavages and click add or update. So, um, for instance, last days, we would say cleaves on all of these and before any amino acid as it cleaves on, on the, um, there's no trypsin-like proline restrictions here. 
Um, and once you click add or update, that will be in your preferences and will stay with you um, for any setup. The same goes for post translational modifications. While you can set this up in your screen, if there's in your search parameters, if, you're, if there's post translational modifications you use often or customize, um, you can very simply click on, on customize and do post translational modification. So, so this is really important if you're doing cross linking or using uh, PTMs that are not necessarily standard to the Unimod um, database. And here you can just give it a name, type in the minor isotopic mass and, and define which residues can be modified. The labeled quantification methods are your standard TMT, SILAC, and ITRAC methods. Um, and these you'll most likely set up um, or modify as an, as an experimental dependent um, uh, label free. But if you are, say, for instance, doing a lot of TMT nine plexes instead of 10 plexes, um, it's very easy to take that, that quantification method, duplicate it uh, by clicking the duplicate method, and then edit it to whatever you'd like. So if we're doing nine plexes often, we can call it a TMT nine plex, and we can pull out whichever label we are not using. So say 126 and save it, and that will now become a standard um, quantification module um, when you set up your label-free quantification. Um, in the label-free method, you now have two choices. One is identification-directed label-free quantification, and one is feature-based label-free quantification. With identification-directed label-free quantification, what we're doing is we're saying to take all the identified LCMS features and perform label-free quantification on them. So, as long as you have one identification in one of your runs, you will have um, an ID and match between runs will take place. If there are no identifications, then obviously we're not going to run. If there are, if you'd like to do label-free quantification on all the detected features, um, you can switch this to feature-based quantification. And this will essentially do all the label-free quantification and retention time alignment, et cetera, um, on anything that has a feature. So if it just has a de novo um, only peptide, for instance, we'll still be able to quantify that. And so it's really up to you. The feature base is more um, computationally intensive and requires more um, resources and time to do, whereas the identification um, is a quicker um, tool. Um, in the configuration, you also have database and, and spectral library. Um, so database, you can um, certainly configure here or on the fly, um, same with spectral library, and I'll show you how to do this on the fly. Um, and instruments, um, probably, I think we've got 95% of the mass spec types in here, so you're probably okay to leave those as the default. The other thing you can configure is preferences pane. In the preferences pane, you'll see different um, options, like where your default files are. And so this just saves you a bit of time while you're setting up your experiments. Um, you can also change things like your display options. Um, and this includes things like heat maps and things like that. So a, a lot of journals are switching to red, blue, white heat maps, for instance. Um, you can simply click on, on the colors and pick your new colors and heat maps will um, apply um, with these new colors. If you've already run an analysis, you can change it and then hit apply on your summary page um, and it will update with the new colors as well. This is where you'll also find um, display options to show decoy hits and show contaminants um, if you include a contaminant database in your search. Uh, more so in here is, is various, um, and I won't get into them, but it's various options depending on, on the data that you're using, um, as well as in chorus search settings, which I don't think a lot of people are using in chorus, but um, if you are and you have trouble setting that up, you can certainly be in touch with the support team and we'll be happy to, to help.
Um, so that being said, um, briefly to start a new project, um, there are a few things I wanted to highlight in here, but essentially you can click on the project wizard page, um, give it a name and select wherever you'd like to, to save that project. Um, and then you can add your data. And so to add data, you simply click on this button. You can navigate to where your data is being stored. So for this data here to demonstrate. Um, and so these are just two individual Tinstoff files, um, which can be loaded in in the .d. Raw files can be loaded in as, as .raw. Um, and you click open and it pulls it into this list. And from this list, we have to pull it into the project. And so this is where some questions have come up, but essentially what you want to do is pull in either technical or biological or different samples as separate samples. The only time you wanna add multiple files to the same sample is if they're some sort of fractionation experiment. So if you're doing an offline fractionation or a gel-based fractionation, um, then you would wanna put those in the same sample. Um, otherwise, biological replicates, technical replicates, different samples, keep them as separate samples and they can be grouped later on in the label-free quantification step. This is really because what happens is, is when you have offline fractionations, the software is gonna assume that you're gonna have the same number of fractions per different samples that you're comparing. And so we'll actually try to compare those fractions to each other. And so would not be suitable for technical or, or biological replicates. Um, and so I'm just gonna pull these in um, to move forward, but we won't actually run this, but these are basically saying sample one and sample two. I'm giving it an enzyme name. Uh, so you can specify this here or you can specify it later. I typically specify it here. These are trypsin and these are Timstoff files. Um, so I will specify Timstoff um, with CID fragmentation. And most importantly is telling the software what type of acquisition this is, whether it's DDA or DIA data. Once you've selected, if it's all the same, you can simply click copy to whole project and it will copy to the rest of the project for you. Um, but this is an opportunity if you are doing things with multiple enzymes that you could specify um, a different enzyme, um, for instance, for this sample. And so your next step is to do a workflow selection. And so here you have two choices. Um, if you can do a sequence database search, which you're restricted to for a data dependent um, acquisition um, or for a data independent acquisition, you could do either a database search or a library search. For data independent acquisition, the library search is your traditional spectral library search, which I will show you um, in a separate project, while your sequence database search is essentially your um, your direct DIA, um, where we will de novo sequence your DIA data um, and do a database search with it. So um, once you select one, you're given the option to refine your data. And so merge scans is something that you will likely not use unless you're using a very old LTQ type of, of instrument. Um, where you need to increase or merge scans to increase intensity. Um, correct precursor for DDA is something we recommend. And this is also where you would associate features with Chimera scan. And so this is basically where we're telling the software to look for those overlapping features and, and certainly sequence them. And if you wanted to filter any features um, from your your raw data, you can certainly do that here, um, whether you wanted to specify charges or um, retention time, et cetera. Um, certainly we can do that here. And when you go to your database search, you'll set your parameters. And this is something I will show a chart on um, later as well, but basically please don't just use the default error tolerances, please use error tolerances that are specific to your data acquisition type and mass spectrometer type. Um, so for a Timstoff, for instance, we'd use 20 and 0.03. For a 
a Lumos in Orbi Orbi mode, we'd use Canon 0.02 for a Lumos or other tribrid in um, in FTIT mode, we'd use 10 in 0.6. And so it really does play an important role um, and knowing where your data is coming from um, makes a big difference, obviously, in, in which um, parameters you wanna set here. Um, other than that, everything is pretty self-explanatory. Your enzyme, this will override any enzyme you've put in in the original setup. Um, so if you'd like to use what you've used in the original setup, you just leave specified by each sample. And your digest mode um, really explain, tells the software how specific you'd like this to follow the digestion rules. So specific means that you have to have a, um, a enzyme specific cut at both ends of the peptide. Semi-specific means will allow it at only one end of the peptide. Unspecific means as on specific, we can use it um, for at either end, um, basically taking any peptides. And no digestion is only to be used if you're using a peptide database and not a protein database. Um, that being said, your PTMs can be set here. Um, and this, this is what you'll find if you click on set, the set PTM button. Um, the list of recent PTMs that you've most recently used will be here. Common and uncommon um, PTMs, glycans are on their own separate tab, as well as artificial um, PTMs. And so this includes your SILAC labels or your um, biotin type labels, some crosslinkers, um, as well as your TMT, and anything customized will appear in this list. For variable PTMs, we suggest you only include three to four maximum variable PTMs that you expect to be in your sample. Um, and I can show you um, where you can search for more PTMs and, and how that works. Um, your database, you can select, if you've used it before, it will populate in this drop down list. If you're using a new database, you can add it on the fly by clicking view. And then here in the path section, you can navigate to wherever that database is. So if we pick uh, this one, for instance, we can call it, I usually just copy um, the name. And what we can then do is at the top, you have to tell the software the format of the database. So this is a Uniprot database and we suggest, really suggest you validate it. And so validation is generally pretty quick as you can see. It gives you a total number of proteins in that database and shows you that the data is in fact um, within the database is parsed correctly as you would expect. And if it's not, this is a good opportunity to um, reselect the type of, of database it is or check your parsing. And we'll also tell you what's invalid. So it will pull out um, proteins that are extremely long, greater than a thousand um, amino acids that are probably not true proteins. It will also pull out um, things that contain non-amino um, acid errors. So letters in your sequences that are not um, amino acid letters, for instance. Um, and then once you save this database, it will essentially populate down this list. Furthermore, if you're using something large, like a, the complete SPRAT, you can pull in these taxon ID and tax DMP files, which are downloadable right from here. And what this will allow you to do is actually specify a species instead of using the entire database. And you can use multiple species. So in this particular um, data set that I have, it's human yeast and E. coli. So you can just click on control and you can um, select multiple um, species if you want. And once you hit OK, they'll both be listed here. If you choose a contaminant database like CRAP, um, again, it's the same procedure. You can click view, you can pull it in, and it will populate this list. And you can um, use that as a, as a contaminant database. Now, at the general options, you'll always want to do FDR. And this is where you have your options to run Peaks PTM and Spider right from the workflow. You can certainly do it later, but if you know you're gonna to wanna to run it, you can also run it from the workflow. 
Peaks PTM is, is interesting. So the way Peaks PTM works, and if you click on advanced settings, it's basically going to take every de novo sequence that doesn't match to your database and see what happens if we put in a specified PTM, does it now match? So it's somewhat like an open search, but this is really where you're gonna to wanna to put in, if you have a lot of variable modifications you're interested in, because what that will do is it really limits the search space that you're looking at by only looking at high quality de novos that didn't match as opposed to every single potential um, spectra. And so if you click on advanced settings, you can you have the choice of searching with the 312 built in or your own, um, you can set up. And the 312 built in um, only include things in the common and the uncommon list. They don't include the glycans or the artificials. So certainly if you're looking for, for glycosylation, um, you know, sometimes I'll often look for an unlinked glycosylation. So I'll search by by residue site, and then I'll take everything with an N um, and, and add that to the variable list um, and go from here. And so this is a, a much faster way of, of doing a, a PTM search um, as opposed to putting everything in the main search. Spider is a homology search. It's gonna look for a single site variance based on homology. Again, with only those um, de novo um, that pass a 15% threshold. Um, and then you can move on to quantification. Um, here again on the quantification workflow, you have a couple of choices, label free, um, iTrack, TMT, and SILAC. You label free, you're simply specifying your mass error tolerance. If it is eye mobility data, your eye mobility tolerance. Um, and new to Peaks Pro is you no longer have to specify retention time. Shift tolerance, we can auto detect this for you by clicking this button. Um, and so what that really does is take some of the guesswork out of setting up your label free quantitation. Um, so you can set that up and this is where you will want to set up your grouping. So if you have multiple samples that are different groups, you can put them in together. And if you don't have, mo if you have samples that are um, each individually samples, you can put those in together. And so I'll show you that in the data set. And so the first data set I wanted to show you, as I said, is, is from this paper um, from Jurgen Cox's lab. And so it's Tim's Toff data where there are six samples and we've run all six separately. Um, and the top three correspond to sample A and the bottom three correspond to sample B. And so, when we look at just the database search, um, when you open up your, your, your search results, you get a summary page. And so there are a couple of things that are new in XPro that you'll see on the summary page one. Um, we did change this in X plus, but not many people know we're now using Peptide FDR in Studio. And so this is controllable by clicking this FDR button and you can um, pick whatever level of, of FDR you would like. Furthermore, we now allow you to filter on protein FDR. Um, you can click protein and you can select the percentage. You're not limited in any dropdown list in, in Studio that you see up here. You're not limited to what's in the dropdown list. If you'd like to use something different, you can certainly type that in and the software will have no problem um, using that value. except that I've remotely desktoped in and seem to have caused to not like me. My apologies for that. And so I'm going to close this remote desktop and then try to Reconnect it. The joys of COVID. Okay. Let's try reconnecting. Real the peaks.
and quickly open my project. And I should say that these projects, we will make them available um, for download so you can play around with them um, if you'd like. Uh, and so when we did, um, it's gonna take a moment. What, when we did um, this data set, what we did is we asked our friends at Brooker to basically run the same ground truth data set that we know the ratios in a DIA mode as well. And so we took the DDA data from, um, from this data set and created a spectral library. And so all this is opening. I will connect to another remote desktop and show you the library viewer. Um, Again, my apologies for that. Uh, unexpected technical difficulties. Um, and so when you have your database search from, from your data, what you can do is um, export it just like you would export anything else and create a spectral library with it. And so new to the to Peaks Pro is this library viewer page that you'll see here. And so you can click on this icon. And the whole point of this icon is that it brings up this um, library viewer. Now, when you first open it, there will be nothing here. Um, and you can simply click on open a library here. And what you can do is you can pick any spectral library. And so what we've allowed for is the ability to pull in Spectronaut or OpenMS libraries in text format. Um, you just simply pull that text into a folder and select the folder or any Peaks library or any Peaks online library. And so you can simply click on, on the folder um, in this viewer and click open and it will take a moment and what that software will do is it will essentially go through and open up your spectral library for you. And so what we've allowed people to do is really take a look at the details of their library. And so you have a very high level overview of what data set was put into the library. And then you have customizable graphs that show you the overall health of the library. And so this can be um, precursor M over Z distribution, um, charge straight distribution, uh, precursor length, et cetera. And what you can also see is basically every single peptide that goes into that library, what the spectrum looks like, what the ions look like for that particular peptide and what the intensity of those ions are. And so one of the things where a lot of effort has been put into not only developing this, but using the 4D features um, from Timstoff or FAMES or HDMSE data and using that data in the library. And so this includes now, we have a column that gives you the one over K0 um, for Timstoff data, or if you're using FAMES data, it will give you the CV value. Um, and that's associated with that particular spectra. And so what this really does is it improves the, the accuracy of, of the library searches. And so, when we um, create this library, what you can do is if this is actually created from a, a text file, from a Spectronaut or a, an OpenMS, is once you've opened this and pulled the data in, you can save this as a Peaks Studio um, library format. You click on save and call it whatever you'd like. Um, and then that library can now be used with any of your data within the Peaks Studio software. Um, and so it's kind of a nice feature that you can actually 
um, look for this. You can actually search for a particular um, um, sequences um, by um, ion, and you can view both the, um, the ion intensity as well as the ion mapping of those particular um, ions. Furthermore, you have really what the parameters that, that the data was acquired at um, and searched at, including precursor and fragment tolerances, which can really help with, with setting up your library search to know that you're in the same um, ranges with each other. And so if I close this, get rid of this, bring this back, um, we're just loading the database search. What you want to do with your database search to create a library is to simply open your, your database search and set whatever filters you feel necessary um, to create a good library. And so this includes FDR at the peptide level, FDR at the protein level, um, and um, any other number of unique peptides, things like that. All of these settings that you set in your database search at the top when you export to your library will be contained within the library. And so, yes, you can create multiple libraries over and over from the same data set, um, but obviously what you'd want to do is, is um, export it properly the first time. The other thing I will mention in the library viewer is if you edit your file in a, a CSV format, you can combine multiple searches or multiple libraries offline. You can't yet do that within the, the suite, but you can certainly do that um, um, within a text editor and pull it back in. Um, I apologize for this opening. It is Tim's Toff data, but I did want to show it to you. Um, and I will not do anything funky that will cause remote desktop to crash again. Um, but essentially, yes, as I was saying, any of the drop down lists can be completely customizable, um, and you do not have to use the the values that are um, certainly outlined in the drop-down um, list. Okay, so now it's being set up what I what I suggested before, um, and so what you'll find with Studio is. Um, you'll find a table summary with the total um, MS1s and, and, and statistics from all your data sets, as well as um, this sample overlap chart. And so this will appear as Venn diagrams if you have less than three samples. If you have more than three, it appears as these charts. If you have more than six or eight, it doesn't show up at all. Um, just because it becomes a bit cumbersome to look at. But what you're looking at is either the total unique proteins, top proteins or peptides um, across samples and how they overlap with each other. So sample one to two has 7,601 shared uh, protein. So that, if you're comparing samples, that could be quite useful to you. Um, the other thing you'll see uh, if you go down here is a software mass calibration, which has now been improved. And so if your data is acquired at a slightly less than I, or slightly less than perfect calibration, as long as you're within the, the depicted or set error tolerances, the software can correct that. And so once you're happy with all your settings, you can click export. You can click either HTML reports or your CSV files. But if you want to create a spectral library, you click on the spectral library tab um, and you have your choice to do it for a Peaks library or if you're using another software, um, an OpenMS library downstream. What does the label free quantification look like? That didn't crash, that's open still. So when we open that label free quantification, um, you have a couple of, of settings. And one of the questions we always get is, I've not seen very many proteins or why not? Um, a lot of that comes down to filters. And so if we look at the protein filters, um, 
to start with, if you click on edit, um, you have a couple of choices. One is significance. And so if you click, if you, the default is actually 20. Um, if you want to see all your proteins, I suggest you drop this down to zero. Um, and same with full change, the default when you open an LFQ is two. But if you want to see everything, I would suggest you drop that down to one. And so these are actually filters. When we look at significance, we're basically comparing, um, in this case, an ANOVA, looking for statistically significant proteins between sample group A and sample group B. And so if we say we only want to see a, a significant protein and increase that threshold, obviously the, the all we're going to see are, are the significant proteins. And so these are just display data. Um, and these are just display filters. But whatever you set in these filters affects everything downstream, whether that be in the protein tab, peptide tab, feature tab. And so it's really important to pause at the summary page and set up um, the features that you would like. Um, same with normalization factor. And so when you, if you'd like to do normalization across samples, you have a couple of, of different um, options. In this case, the human is actually spiked in at a one-to-one -one ratio. And so I would argue that, you know, really we should be using the human proteins to normalize this data set. And so if you'd like to do that, you can certainly do that or any specific proteins by clicking on this internal standard proteins and you can actually just search human and it will select everything by accession that has human. And if you right click, you can actually mark all of these. And what will happen is it will use all the human proteins to normalize. Um, of course, you have to click apply um, and that would change it. If we look at the peptide filters, you have a couple of, of options, a quality um, score. The default is, is zero as, as with average area. These are all customizable depending on, on the instrument you're using. Um, but two things to point out are, are peptide ID count. So this is basically the number of, of peptide identifications that have to be seen and then have at least X number of confident samples. And so what we're saying here is, we're saying that this, that a peptide has to be confident in at least one of the six samples to be considered, um, or one of the samples per group. If you'd like to really increase that stringency, you can pop that up to three and say, I want to see this confidence in, in all three um, replicates. So if you're doing, um, you know, if you really only want to see things that are consistently identified in, in all three of your replicates, um, you would change that. And so how do we do? Well, if we look at the, at the protein feature, um, what, we're, what we filtered for is the human proteins. And you can see from the volcano plot that these all hover around one to one. If we went and actually looked for things that are different, like the yeast, we can type in yeast and we can filter only for the yeast proteins. And these are all coming up at a, at a one to two ratio as we would expect. This volcano plot is actually um, interactive. So if you clicked on any of these um, points, it will or double click on any of these points, it will actually take you to that particular protein in the list. And then you can actually look at more detail about those particular proteins. And so what does this include? Well, um, if you look at your sample groupings or hover over, you'll actually see the ratios um, for individual samples or at the group level if we combine these groups together. You can also look at the peptides that make up that protein. So we will only use um, unique peptides for label-free quantification, and we use a top three method. And if you wanted to actually look into more detail about these, you can double click on that peptide and view the actual extract line chromatogram from the samples like so. Um, and then you could also look at the features, which is probably where you want to look um, if you're trying to compare. Um, and so the, the feature is actually showing you the extracted feature, whether you'd like it in 2D or 3D. And this graph can be manipulated or increased by holding control um, and using your scroll bar to increase the zoom um, in the features. 
the purple area shows you where those have been extracted from. And just like in the LCMS view, which I'm sure you know how to use, um, but if not, we can certainly show you how to do that. You can um, decrease or increase the intensity thresholds um, to show the areas. The other thing you can click on is retention time alignment. And what you'll see is where this peak was picked um, across all of your samples. Um, so briefly, what does this look like in a, a library search? Well, when we open a library, um, if you're opening a project that hasn't been opened before and it's a library, what the software will ask you for is to help point it to where that library is. So in this case, it's this library, or you can proceed without the library. And when you click OK, it'll basically pull in the, the data with that, that library format. So what we've done here is basically replicated the exact same six samples, um, but run them on a Timstoff in D data independent mode. And so if I flip back here, and so showing you the library viewer I've done. So we've created the library from this data set. Um, and then what I can show you is really how to set up this library search. And so when we set up a, a library search with data independent data, what you can do is exactly the same thing that you've done before. You start a new project. Um, you pull in your data files from wherever they're located. And this time we'll say it's data independent. When you do your, your workflow, we will select spectral library search. And so when you select your spectral library search, what you're given are the same precursor uh, parameters that you would expect, um, as well as allowing for a certain ion mobility tolerance. Um, and then you simply select your library. If you haven't in put, pulled your library into Peaks yet, just like a database, you can click on view and you get the spectral library info page where you can simply browse to wherever your library is. So let's say I pick, I'll pick this one and I will copy that name and put it in here and hit validate. It will take a moment and it will go through that library and validate that library. And it will give you similar information that you see in the library viewer. Um, and this of course can be um, chosen however you'd like, but the, either the meta info or the precursor distribution or anything else, and you can hit save and this will now populate this drop down list. So if we go back to this database, the other thing we can do if you wanted to filter your library to only search for certain things, this is a dynamic process. So let's say we only wanted things that are um, three to six. And as soon as you click elsewhere, it will update. And so now what we're saying is we've now limited our library to only 19% of it. Um, obviously the majority of things in this library are doubly charged. Um, and so, but we will only do that search with that 19%. And so that can be helpful depending on, on your application. And then you will want to include a reference database if you want to associate this with proteins. And again, I would use whatever protein um, you would like, but the process remains the same. If you've pulled that database in before, it will be in this list. And if not, um, it will be, you can add it in without any issues. And so what does the data look like when you, um, when you do a database or a library search? You no longer have de novos. Um, because we're not doing de novo, um, but you do have um, any of your ion matches for any protein. And what you see if you click on the peptides is in fact um, all your peptide matches. So if you pick something um, where you have a lot of um, proteins or something that you, you don't have a lot of, of matches, you get the same um, thing, you get a score 
mass and in various details about those particular peptides. And so what does it look like if you want a more detail on it? Well, again, just like in, in with the database search, you can double click and you can view both your, your library um, view as well as the query, which is what you, the data you've generated um, as well as a match um, intensity to, to your, to your data. And so again, this can be put through a standard label free by clicking on, on quantification and setting up your label free quantification in that way. And when you do that, um, what you get is a very, very similar result to what you would expect. Um, and in this case, the data, um, we're using the same library. So we obviously expect a very good result. Um, but again, you can see we've just flipped the two samples around, but the E. coli's are all um, high in one, low in the other with a better, uh, um, the expected distribution um, and the yeast person if we filtered for human, um, they're not being displayed because we've, we've filtered them out, but um, a lot of the humans sit in the middle here um, at one-to-one -one ratio. And so, you know, really the, the, the library search has really been enhanced to include um, to include these um, better quantification, but also to, to give you the library viewer, but also to, to look for more, um, to include that fourth dimension into your um, label-free quantification. Um, I think I need to re-pull in that library to see those spectra, but um, same thing. Um, when you look at, the, at these exact um, peptides, you'll see these, these matches and you can cycle through the, the, the window, if you will, the, the DIA window, if you'd like. And what you'll see is a, um, these peptides as they come off um, the column, you'll see the, the view. Um, it's quite easy to flip back to the protein view to see where that came from by clicking on that one button. Um, and again, you can see that, that view here. And so I won't show you other data, but we will have specific webinars on things like veins and, and SILAC. Um, but really the, the, the basics of, of those have all been um, pulled in into the webinar, into the, into the software so that the fourth dimension feature is really um, now being shown um, both in the LC IMS view, um, as well as in the feature detection, as well as in use in, in spectral libraries. And so one thing I will mention is how do we do FDR with spectral libraries? Um, so with, with database searches, we do um, a target decoy approach um, with FDR in our library search, what we do is we um, basically shuffle peptide sequences around. And so while the precursor mass and charge will stay the same as will the retention time, the fragment ion list um, of M over Zs are really going to shift. And so what this allows us to do is really allows us the software in the background to look for a couple of things. One is to look at the alignment of the MS2s to the MS1s and the precursors. And um, one is to look at the quality of these um, peaks. And so when we have an actual hit, um, we get nice quality peaks, which appear um, at a higher discriminant score. And when we get poor peaks, um, they show down here. And this allows us to estimate our, our FDR. Um, I won't highlight FAMES data. Um, or TMT data, although I planned on it, but in the interest of time, I won't uh, show that. But I will show some quick tips or FAQs that we have um, have a lot of, of requests for. So one of the things I showed was the performance configuration. And so um, really to optimize um, the various threads, we have the 16 thread or the 32 license version of Studio. Um, we, to start all of these threads and maximize, you really need um, around 20 logical processors for the 16 node or 40 for the, for the 32 thread workstation. 
Um, but if you don't have that many, you can certainly use less. What we suggest is to use 80% of the maximum threads you have. And so um, if you have, for instance, a max of, if your computer has 16 threads, we'd suggest 12 threads. And then the other thing we suggest is three gigabytes of allocated memory per thread. So if you're using 12 to use um, 3,600 megabytes. Um, we also suggest that you set your window settings to never sleep while using peaks um, because sleeping in the middle of a search can cause the search to shut down and, and you won't be able to restart from where you left off. Um, and then this is something that I mentioned earlier. It's really important to, to specify your parent and your fragment mass tolerances for the machine that you're using. Um, and this will really, you know, what you want to be as tight as possible because if you have the accuracy on the mass spec, why not use it? Um, the only time you really want to extend these is maybe if you see something like this, but perhaps your um, initial data is half cut off because it's outside of the window, then you have reason to extend um, to a wider uh, mass tolerance error. But what we do find is people using um, you know, the default or, or 0.6 or 0.5 tolerance errors for really high resolution Orbi Orbi data or Timstoff data, and that's really affecting the results in a negative way because it reduces the, um, the quality of the scoring and it also reduces the, um, the identifications. Um, validate database I touched on earlier, but really important to, to, to do that validate database. And just a few things we've seen of late, please don't combine non-ion mobility data with ion mobility data, i.e. FAMES and non-FAMES together. Um, and don't combine DIA and DDA into the same project. Keep those as separate um, projects um, with your individual data type. And so that being said, if I uh, apologize for going over for a few minutes and the technical difficulties, but if you um, do have any questions, I'm happy to take them now, or you can um, always contact us at support at bioinfo.com. Um, or if you have to talk to your account manager, sales at bioinfo.com. Um, and we have, um, yeah. And if you're able to um, attend any of the other webinars in our series, please do uh, feel free to register and um, attend. And I'm giving a couple of them as well as some of our other application scientists. Um, and they'll be more targeted. Um, on specific applications of the of the software. I so want to pull. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to use the chat or to unmute yourself. And if not, I really do appreciate uh, you taking the time to attend.